Hello guys, my name is Nagura and today we're going to be talking about the new command board or mission table in Shadowlands. So the new command board looks different to what we're used to from previous expansions, but it isn't as complicated as it seems once you understood the basics of it. So first of all, we're going to be going into a quick TLDR about the mission board and I will go into more details later on. All right, so you start off with one companion, depending on your covenant. If you're Kyrian, your companion will be Pelagos, Nia for Night Fae, Marileth for Necrolords, and Nadia for Venthyr. You also have two different kinds of troops available. These can be put on the board multiple times. So each troop can be put as many times as you want into one mission onto the board. So make sure you fill up the board all the way with those troops, especially on difficult missions. All right, the missions cost Anima to start, and they can award gold, Anima, experience for your companions, Items, trading goods, and rarely soul ash. The currency that you need to craft legendaries. So this is very important for your legendaries and your player power. So companions have levels. You should try to level up your companions as fast as you can by sending them on missions at all times. And you also should be keeping an eye out for experience reward missions. These reward a lot of experience currently, and they are incredibly important to make sure your companions are stronger. Your troops don't need to be leveled, so you don't have to put in your troops when you do those experience missions. Your troops have the average item level of your, uh, the average level, sorry, of your companions. Your companions can come out of a battle with lost HP. Now you can heal them up for a high anima cost, but companions also heal to full HP by leveling up. So on the early levels, when you get level up a lot, uh, you might just want to send them on a mission anyway, even though they are low HP, and just heal them by leveling them up through that mission. Just make sure you might do an easier mission when your companion is on lower HP, instead of sending them on a really hard mission, because uh, then they might not be able to do it because your companion is going to die faster. Your troops don't need to be healed, they will always be in full HP. Keep an eye out for campaign missions. Um, those missions have a silver border around them and they're named campaign something. Uh, the reward says adventure campaign progress. This challenge leads to additional adventures with greater rewards. You can basically get another campaign, like, like these uh, campaign missions, after successfully doing one of them. And this will repeat until you finally find a campaign that gives you soul ash. But these Soul Ash missions are actually really high level right now and they are very difficult to do uh, with the current level on the followers or companions that we have. So just make sure that you level your companions first. So once you do get those Soul Ash missions, you can actually do them. All right, and lastly, you're able to get a second companion at the moment. Uh, so in week one of Shadowlands, it is a random objective you need to complete spawning in Torghast on layer two to three. So go farm that layer uh, right now if you want to have your second companion. The next week onwards, we will be able to get more followers, but right now in the first week, you only are able to get that second companion. All right, so now we're gonna be going into more detail. So initially you will only have one companion and your troops available to you. The companion available depends on your covenant. If you're a Kyrian like me, then you will have Pelagos available as your first companion. At the moment, there is actually a way to get a second companion from Torghast, so this is the first week of Shadowlands. And it seems to be a random obje objective spawning on layer 2 in Torghast. The wing doesn't seem to be mattering at all, and each covenant has one specific extra follower that you can obtain. Kyrian uh, is Kethakios. Nightwe is uh, Yeralia, Necrolord is Kalatar, and Venthyr is Gorchlimb. So once you have received this specific second companion for your covenant, you don't have to keep farming the Toria Slayer because you will only be able to get this one companion at the moment. Uh, later on though, in the next couple of weeks or throughout the expansion, we will be able to get more companions from Torghast, six covenant related companions and four generic companions. So we will be getting 10 followers or companions in total from Torghast. And we will get another six companions from our campaign. So next week, for example, once we are renowned four, we will be unlocking one extra companion as well. All right, so each mission needs at least one companion to start, but you can fill up the board with as many troops as you want, and it does increase the anima cost for the mission for each extra troop you put in. But it's only one extra cost, as you can see right here. Uh, I put in one companion and I fill the rest of the board with um, troops, and you can see each troop that I add 
adds one extra anima cost. So that's really not that much. And you should make sure that you're filling out the board every time. Now, if I only put troops and no companions, you can see that I cannot start the mission because it needs at least one of the companions in here. Now, there's uh, two things you need to consider when you fill up the board. Number one, which companions do you put on the board and how many of which troops? And then you also want to ask yourself, where do you position those companions and troops that you chose to put on the board? Now to answer the first question, which troops or how many of which troops you want to put in, it depends on what mission you're fighting right now. For example, I have one damage dealer, one melee DPS as a troop and one tank. Tanks usually have a lot more HP, but they do less damage. And melee, they do a little bit more damage, but have um, a little bit less HP. We can check the HP over here. You can see this melee DPS here, the Kirin uh, Haltbardier, has only 390 HP, but 104 attack. Well, the Phalanx here, the tank, has 780 HP and only 52 attack. So definitely means that if we're playing against heavy damage missions, then I might want to be putting more of the tanks in. While if I'm playing against a very tanky mission where there's a bunch of tanks and healers possibly, then I want to be putting in more damage dealers. Now there are tanks, healers, melee DPS and range DPS. I've already explained uh, the, the difference between like a tank and a DPS. And the healers, of course, are healing, right? Uh, some of the healers actually have a pretty high attack value as well. So just keep that in mind once you look at your companions and your troops. Now the difference between melee DPS and range DPS is that your melee DPS usually only attack the front line with their auto attack. Now this specific melee DPS that I have here does have a special attack that attacks the furthest enemy away, but only every three rounds with their special ability. So each round is switching up between first your companions and troops attack the enemy players and then the enemies attack your board and then it just keeps rotating through and your special abilities have a cooldown as you can see this is only every three rounds but once the ability is in cooldown your troops still attack every single turn also your tanks attack and your healers attack every single troop every single um, companion no matter the role always does the auto attack that happens every round and this auto attack will always be um, this attack value that you can see here on the companion now when it comes for position when it comes to positioning you need to consider the companions and troops hp their auto attack value as i just mentioned and their special ability their hp can be seen by hovering over here as well as i said you can hover over the Minions here, you can also see the enemy HP here as well as you hover over them. And the enemy's attack value cannot be seen, but you can see it here on the top right because the total amount of HP and the total amount of attack value will be uh, seen here and our total HP and total attack damage will be seen at the bottom right. The thing about positioning is that you, first of all, like we... In this specific mission, we are playing against only melee DPS. That means that our front line is going to be taking a lot of damage, while our back line might be pretty safe because all of these troops will be attacking the front line every single time. And then they also have a special ability that says deal two physical damage to the closest enemy. And the closest enemy is also the front line. So this means the front line is going to take a lot of damage, while the back line is almost going to be untouched until the front line is dead. Because melee um, troops will be starting to attack the back line once the front line is dead. So in this specific mission, we should make sure that our front line is staying alive for a long time and our back line should be damage dealers to be able to do as much damage as possible, right? So in this case, we want to put our tanks in the front and we probably want to put our damage dealers in the back. In this case, our damage dealers would be Pelagos, uh, Kithekios and the Harbadier. Now we're going to be looking at how much damage each of these does. Now here, uh, Kithekios, our second companion, actually does not do a lot of damage. As you can see, it's only 50 attack. Well, he's got a lot of HP, 875. Well, 818 right now. Compare that to our tank's HP, 780, it's actually more. So we should be putting our companion here in as well, possibly just repa replacing one of the tanks. Well, in the back line, we are putting Pelagos, our damage dealer, even though he's incredibly low HP, uh, you can see he's only on 74 HP, but he has 108 in tech. And because all of the enemies are only attacking the front line, we should be able to keep Pelagos alive for quite a while. And now this last spot, we can fill up with um, one more damage dealer. 
Um, and now if you can compare the damage values and the HP values, we do have more HP in total and we also have more damage in total. Now, one more thing that you want to consider when uh, you put your followers or troops on the board is their special abilities. Now, for example, this Kyrian Phalanx here has an ability that reads, um, the Phalanx takes 10% reduced damage and protects all ranged allies in the same way. And you can actually see this once you hover the Phalanx over a spot. You see right now, if I put this over here, um, he will give himself a 10% damage uh, decrease, damage taken decrease. And he will also buff my two backline um, companions and troops. So this, on this position as well, he will always buff the backline. Now in this specific scenario, or in general as a Kirin, it's actually not that great to buff the backline. Because for example, in this mission, as I said earlier, the front line is going to be the one that takes all of the damage by all of these minions here. So the damage taking decrease would actually be better if they would be buffing the front. But unfortunately, that doesn't work because this phalanx always buffs the backline, no matter where you put this minion. It always buffs the backline. So that's just how it's going to be. And we just hope that we're going to be able to do this a mission anyway. We're hoping that our front line survives a lot while our back line is finishing off the enemy, front, the enemy line. Now we do have a healer over here, uh, one minion here that says um, heals all allies for four and it only has a cooldown of one round. But the problem is this healer actually has a lot of HP. It has 684 HP compared to the only 342 and 178 of the damage healers. So I was considering um, focusing this one specific minion here because my damage healer here, my troop, has an attack that says uh, the harbadier slices their weapon at their farthest enemy, dealing 124 physical damage, right? Once I hover this troop over the slot, so you can see which one it attacks depending on their positioning. And in theory, I could switch those two because Pelago's positioning doesn't matter because both of his abilities are unrelated to positioning. So I could theoretically switch this to make sure that this troop attacks the healer. But I actually think for this specific mission, it's better to not focus the healer because of his insane HP value. I think that trying to finish off one of the low HP targets, the 178 HP targets, is gonna get is gonna be much better because once we finish off the damage dealers, the heal for four is not gonna be good enough. But uh, I don't think that the healer can be killed before we kill anything else, just because everything. Uh, else is much less HP than the healer. So I think this is going to be the best positioning for me specifically here in this round and I'm going to start this. Hello, so it's the next day and we're going to be taking a look at that mission that I sent away. I'm a little bit afraid that I'm going to lose because Pelagos was on like a slither of HP when I sent this mission off. So we'll see how it goes. Alright, so we put two tanks in the front. The two tanks are buffing the backline as you can see with this um, blue animation. It gives them 10% damage reduction, which is not really needed to be honest, I think, because all of these minions here are attacking the front line, as I mentioned earlier. So they should not be, be they should not be attacked unless the front line is dying. So we'll see how this goes. Ho hopefully Pelagos can stay alive for a long time. But it looks like we already killed off one of the minions here in the in the uh, corner, which is great. Killing off one uh, minion early is really good because then you don't get the auto attacks from that one in and we also see all of the other ones are pretty low HP so we actually should be able to finish this properly and uh, Pelagos is gonna live another day hopefully he's gonna get a um, level upgrade here because if you get a level upgrade then they're healing to full HP of course so we don't have to spend that huge amount of anima to heal them full and yeah it looks like Pelagos did live another day so we're just going to finish this off. You can see how everything works now that um, the left side is dead. Uh, they start attacking the back line too because they're the closest here, right? Because this one is so far away, the right one, they start attacking um, the back line here because it's closer. Even though they're melee and they're tanks in the melee DPS. All right, the healer is the one that, that la dies last because the healer just had so much HP. So I tried to focus everything else first and it seemed like that was a good strategy. And there we go. It wasn't even close actually, so I was afraid for no reason. <laughs> and there we go. We also have a level up on Pelagos. He's level 19 now. So we managed to uh, get that full heal on Pelagos. There we go. Full HP again. All right, that's it. 
yeah, this is basically what you want to be thinking of when you start a mission. You just want to make sure you're reading through the abilities that your troops have. And you also want to make sure that you consider the attack value and the HP value, considering that your troops are going to be attacking the front line first. Unless they're ranged DPS, then they would be attacking the back line first. And then also consider that the enemies, if they're all melee DPS, they're also going to be attacking your front line first. If you're a Night Fae, you have um, your number one companion is going to be Nia. And Nia has a ability that buffs all adjacent minions with 20% damage increase. And this is incredibly good. Now, the thing about this is if you put Nia here in this front position, it will buff all other troops and companions with a 20% damage buff because then they're all adjacent. But Nia is not a very high HP companion and therefore it might not always be the best decision to put Nia here because if you put Nia in the back she will still buff three of the companions or troops. It will only leave out one um, troop or companion on the right side. So by putting her in the back, she will be protected though, and she won't be in the front line to soak all of the damage. So if you're doing a very difficult mission on your uh, Night Fae, then maybe you should consider putting Nia in the back and making sure that she lives longer, because the longer she lives, the longer she will be giving the 20% damage buff to all the other three troops and companions. Well, on the other hand, if you put her in the front, she might die earlier, and then the four troops and companions lose the damage buff earlier. All right, well... Uh, there was a lot of talk about the mission table and companions, but I hope that gave you a little bit of an insight. Uh, another thing that I can recommend doing is once one of your missions is done, instead of just complete instantly skipping to your rewards, you could just be looking through uh, the damage patterns and see how your uh, troops attack depending on your positioning. And that might actually help you to figure out where you should be pos positioning everything. All right, well, that was all that I had to say about the command table or uh, the mission table, command board, so many names for this uh, new um, table here. But yeah, I really hope this helped you out and I hope you can level up your companion so you manage to get that soul ash and you manage to get those missions done so you can craft your legendaries faster. There we go. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you want to watch more videos like these, then make sure you're subscribing to the channel and click the bell so you always know when there's a new video coming out. And you can also check my stream out where I'm streaming almost every day on twitch.tv. Thank you so much for watching and I see you next time. Bye!